buried within Einstein's historic paper on the theory of special relativity, there is a mistake. A mistake which has propagated through the literature for over a hundred years. I'm David, you're watching Cool Worlds, and today I'm going to tell you about my recently accepted paper on relativistic light sails. Hey Cool Worlds, as many of you know, I've been thinking a lot recently about the idea of propelling spacecraft up to relativistic speeds using intense laser beams. All the way back in 1865, James Maxwell showed that light is an electromagnetic wave, which must carry some tiny amount of momentum. That means that when light shines upon an object, it exerts a tiny push, an effect confirmed experimentally even before the First World War in 1900. Recently, Yuri Milner announced plans to fund Breakthrough Starshot, which is a plan to use this effect of light pressure to accelerate a grand mass spacecraft up to one-fifth the speed of light using gigawatt lasers. At the end of April, Breakthrough organized a meeting to discuss possible targets for this spacecraft, and so many exoplanet scientists, like myself, were invited to join the discussion. Frankly, I was surprised and honored to be invited to this meeting, and I was inspired to do some calculations in preparation for a video that I thought I could do here on the Cool Wars channel about Project Starshot. This light sailing technique works best when the spacecraft reflects 100% of the light back towards the source in order to avoid overheating of the spacecraft. So essentially you have a moving mirror. After doing a bit of research, I realized there are some interesting distortions which happen to your image when you look in a mirror which is moving at such high speeds. If you want to get that, you can check out my earlier video up here. But of course, aside from calculating what happens to the light which reflects off the mirror, for Project Starshot, what's more interesting is what happens to the mirror itself. How fast does this mirror go in response to light hitting it? So after making all these calculations, I figured, what the hey, why not put it together into a short research paper, and I submitted it to a peer-reviewed journal before heading to this conference. Now, I wasn't really sure, to be honest with you, whether other people had done these calculations before. After all, my normal research area is exoplanets and not special relativity. But I figured, why not throw it out there? I stuck it online, saw what the referee would say, and get some feedback from the community. So after speaking to some colleagues here and getting my referee report back, the verdict was that my equations appeared correct, but it would be great if I could compare my work to all of the previous literature calculations on the same subject. And that was a great point. I mean, either I'm getting the same result as everybody else in the literature, in which case, you know, what's the point of even publishing the paper? or I'm getting something different, in which case that's interesting. Now it turns out that there is a lot of papers of people calculating light bouncing off moving mirrors at all sorts of angles and configurations, but usually the focus is on what happens to the light after the reflection, and not so much what happens to the mirror in response to that light hitting it. Of course, the Breakthrough team care much more about the movement of this mirror, which represents their spacecraft, than they do for the reflected light. So one of the team members put together this comprehensive 73-page report which compiled together all of the relevant equations. Now this is where things get interesting because the equation I derived differs from that in this report. Specifically, my equation predicts that it takes about 10% less energy to reach one-fifth the speed of light than this report does. Okay, so my default assumption at this point was that I must be wrong, I must have made a mistake, but let's check out and compare what the difference is. But there are no prior experiments of accelerating mirrors up to one-fifth the speed of light, so I certainly can't go to the lab and just look and see who's right or wrong. But in all of these calculations, you don't just get the movement of the mirror coming out of them, you also get how the light's frequency changes as a result of this reflection. The solutions come as a pair. Now it's actually advantageous to focus on this latter point, how light changes its frequency, because there was a much richer literature available for me to make comparisons to. So it's not surprising that my equation for how light changes its frequency also disagrees with that from this report, as you can see here. At this point in the story, I dug into that report and I found out that the equations they were using were derived in an earlier paper by the same team. Their derivation essentially works like this. Consider a particle of light called a photon, which has been fired at a moving mirror. Next, let's move into the rest frame of the mirror using a mathematical technique called a Lorentz transform, which leads to the photon appearing redshifted. Now, and this part is really crucial, the authors assume that in this frame of reference, the photon's frequency is the same 
before and after the reflection. Finally, they then Lorentz transform back to the original frame of reference and they have all of their equations. For comparison, I did the derivation differently. I didn't do a frame transfer. I just stuck in the observer's frame of reference, but then balanced relativistic energy and momentum as compared to before and after this reflection. But of course, no matter how you do it, these two methods should arrive at the same answer but seemingly they don't. By now I was really scratching my head and curious as to what on earth was going on. How could these answers disagree? Fortunately, lots of other people have tackled this problem before, so let's compare these equations to all of that previous literature. In fact, the paper trail goes all the way back to Albert Einstein himself in the very same paper in which he introduced the world to his theory of special relativity in 1905. The Electrodynamique Copper. Towards the end of that paper, Einstein illustrated his new theory of special relativity with several example calculations, one of which in section 8 was the case of reflecting a photon off a perfect mirror. Now Einstein didn't actually calculate how the mirror's speed changes in response to this reflection. Instead he focused on how the light's frequency changes as a result of it. But that's great, we can work with that and compare his prediction for the frequency change versus that from what I did. Well, Einstein gets exactly the same equation as that of this breakthrough report. Indeed, as far as I can tell, everybody for the last 100 years has been getting the same result. So yes, that's right, my equation disagrees with pretty much everybody, including Einstein himself. Ordinarily, this is where one stops and admits defeat. I mean, how can it possibly be that a scientist working on exoplanets not relativity, can be right, and everyone else for the last hundred years, including Einstein himself, is wrong. The scientists get emails all the time from crackpots who claim they have some theory which proves that Einstein is wrong, and we've grown a very thick skin in response to it. In fact, just the phrase Einstein is wrong immediately has this like gut instinct to recoil and think this person must be crazy. So on the one hand, my self-doubt was telling me I must be wrong. But on the other hand, my mind was telling me that something was out of place here, that something Einstein did in that derivation violated one of the most sacred principles of physics, the conservation of energy. Let me explain. Einstein did his derivation in more or less the same way I described earlier using Lorentz transforms, which makes sense because you know everybody has been citing Einstein of course for the last hundred years. Specifically, Einstein moves into the rest frame of the mirror and then explicitly assumes that the frequency of the reflected light must equal the frequency of the incident light. There, right there, is where Einstein is wrong because that assumption violates the conservation of energy. Think of it like this, working in the rest frame of the mirror is equivalent to just having a mirror sat in front of you at rest, not moving. Now throw a photon at it and think about what happens. The reflection causes the photon to reverse direction and so its momentum changes from plus p to minus p. Now a fundamental physical law is that momentum has to be conserved in a closed system so therefore the mirror has to move in response from initially with a momentum of zero to finally with a momentum of 2p. That way the system's total momentum is the same before and after the reflection as required. What I'm really saying in plainer English is that when the light hits the mirror, it has to slightly start moving. Now that should make sense intuitionally because if the mirror doesn't start moving, then the entire concept of light sailing and radiation pressure would not exist. It would mean that for a mirror initially at rest, no matter how many photons you throw at it, the mirror would never move. We know that doesn't happen, both experimentally and even with spaceflight demonstrations of solar sailing. Okay, so we've established that the mirror has to start moving when light hits it, even if it's initially at rest. Okay, so what's the big deal about that? Well, what it means is that the mirror has gained kinetic energy. Now remember that most sacred law of thermodynamics that we cannot destroy or create energy, it must be conserved in a closed system. Therefore, if the mirror gains kinetic energy, the photon must lose energy. There's no two ways about it. And since the energy of a photon is given by Planck's constant multiplied by its frequency, 
then if I decrease the energy of the photon, I have to decrease its frequency as well. In other words, Einstein's assertion that in the rest frame of the mirror, the frequency of the reflected light equals the frequency of the incident light cannot be true. It turns out that one can get the same answer as Einstein, even by balancing energy and momentum, as long as one is willing to assume that the photon's energy is negligible compared to the rest mass energy of the mirror. Critically though, Einstein never states this as an assumption in his derivation, which is why his equations are formally wrong rather than just being incomplete. The result was presented as if generally true in all circumstances and cases, and that's why people have been using it erroneously for over 100 years. You might justifiably think though that even though this tacit assumption by Einstein is technically wrong, that in all practical situations, it's gonna give you more or less the right answer. After all, even for a gram mass spacecraft like Starshot, the photon's energy is expected to be 300,000 billion, billion, billion times less than that of the rest mass of the mirror. And that's completely true. But if you want to accelerate a sail up to one fifth of the speed of light, then you are going to have to throw at it 30,000 billion, billion, billion photons at it. And so this error, whilst tiny for an individual photon, accumulates literally trillions of times to end up giving you a sizable 10% effect. There's a related effect to this problem called Compton scattering, where a photon scatters off a single electron. It's essentially the same problem, except that the mirror is now replaced with just a single particle, an electron. Because the electron has such a tiny mass, you definitely don't want to assume it has infinite mass compared to the photon when you do this calculation. So this problem provides a really nice test bed to compare to. And what's reassuring is that in the special case of a single photon at normal incident angle, the equations of Compton scattering and that of my own work agree with each other. So that's reassuring. It gives me faith that what I'm doing here is correct. Okay, so I've demonstrated that Einstein got something wrong, but please, let's not get carried away here. I categorically did not show or claim that Einstein's theory of special relativity is wrong. Merely that one small example problem he did in that famous paper is off at the 10% level for starshot-like parameters. I mean, Einstein probably never dreamed that we'd be thinking of accelerating probes up to relativistic speeds using radiation pressure. So, you know, I'm really exploring a very extreme part of parameter space. And I think, you know, let's give Einstein a bit of slack. In all fairness, there's no reason why he would have considered this part of parameter space. Einstein is an utter genius and one of my all-time scientific heroes. Those little example calculations at the end of his paper were just that, they were just for fun. So, you know, really let's not try and be throwing shade at Einstein because it was a very small mistake in one of those example calculations. What's neat is that this actually ends up saving us energy and makes Starshot easier at the 10% level in terms of energy costs. And since less energy needs to shine on the sail now, it should also make it a little bit easier in terms of the thermal stability and ride stability of the sail too. Remember that this is not my field of expertise. So you might reasonably ask, how was it that somebody from the outside was able to come in and, and see an insight that was missed by so many for so long? I'm not a genius, I'm not special. To me, this is just a really nice example of how doing outreach like this makes us better scientists. Since I'm thinking up cool ideas for videos for you guys, I'm often thinking about topics outside of just exoplanets. I'm thinking about other sciences as well. And if I didn't do outreach, if I didn't do videos like this, then I would have just stayed in my lane, thought about exoplanets and missed this insight. Second, I think this is a great example of how sometimes being an outsider to a field can give you a fresh perspective and unique angle that can be missed by others who are used to thinking about the problem. When I tackled this derivation, I actually didn't know what terms were typically assumed to be small or large or what conventional approximations were made. So I just derived the damn thing exactly. I didn't know what else to do. So by being an outsider, I was able to tackle this problem in a unique way and end up with an insight that would be very difficult for somebody who is just following the textbook and conventional way 
of doing this problem. So if you've made it to this point in the video, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed hearing about my personal account of how I sort of stumbled across this realization. I'm sure you have many questions as well about this problem, so feel free to hit them down below in the comment section, I'll get back to you. If you like our content and want to get all the videos from the Cool Words channel, then of course make sure you click the subscribe button down below. And until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious.